Stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. I truly believe that thoughts are the greatest vehicle to change. We do not care whether the cat is black or white, as long as it can catch mice. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory however long and hard the road may be. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. The ladies not for turning. Alexander the Great, who in 13 years established one of the largest empires of the ancient world, profoundly stated, remember, upon the conduct of each depends the fate of all. Critical to his success was his intelligence gathering, his use of spies, and his art of deception. In warfare, whilst the weapons have changed, much of the art remains the same. I bring this to your attention because today, there is a new war that every business and person faces. It is the cyber war. Hello and welcome to another episode of No Limitations, a show where we speak to elite world-class performing men and women and unlock the secrets and influences that have shaped their destinies and that you could apply to your own life. I'm your host, Greg Robinson, Managing Partner of Blenheim Partners, Executive Search and Board Advisory Firm. This episode with Major General Marcus Thompson of the Australian Army and Head Information Warfare of the Australian Defence Force Headquarters is very special and compulsory listening. We cover the war on cyber and learnings for business with an expert who is defending the cyber attacks on behalf of the Australian nation. Major General Marcus Thompson drove the design, establishment and creation of the Information Warfare Division within the Australian Defence Force, covering cyber, electronic warfare, intelligence, space, artificial intelligence, and the necessary strategies. He has served in Afghanistan and led a diverse team of 200 personnel drawn from 32 nations. He was previously posted to Headquarters Special Operations as the Director General Special Operations Capability, and a number of years back was seconded to the Prime Minister and Cabinet. In 2014, he was appointed a member of the Order of Australia. So sit back and listen to this illuminating discussion and learn how state-sponsored professionals, criminals or script kiddies target the unsuspecting. Marcus, welcome to the show. G'day, Greg. How are you? Oh, fantastic. Marcus, what is the head of information warfare of the Australian Defence Force? That's me. So uh, I came into that role or this role in July 2017 when the then Chief of the Defence Force decided that we needed a way to bring together a lot of these uh, technical enabling uh, capabilities that are essential for a joint military force. And so in this case, uh, those capabilities comprised of cyber, electronic warfare, intelligence, space-based capabilities, uh, targeting and command and control. And my task uh, was to bring all of those capabilities together in to something coherent that could be used by deployed military commanders. It's quite the portfolio. So how would you position us against our allies? Oh, I think we're in relatively good shape. I mean, I think most of these capabilities are, uh, are closely aligned with our with our Five Eyes partners, being the United States, yep. uh, the United Kingdom, Canada, and New Zealand. And there's a lot of commonality uh, amongst amongst the Five Eyes. Sure, there's there's differences and, and nuances between our respective sovereign approaches, uh, but uh, but we're we're across the board we're relatively aligned, and, and that comes from the last uh, nineteen or twenty years of of, uh, of shared operations overseas. And I guess with that, Marcus, what are we actually facing in terms of enemy? Where's their level of sophistication? Oh, well, I think there's varying threats out there. And I should say that whilst I've got that broad portfolio. Mm. When we stood up, the Chief of the Defence Force made it very clear to me that my priority, main effort, was to be the development of cyber 
capabilities for okay. the Australian Defence Force, and that's been reinforced by the current Chief of the Defence Force, uh, General Campbell. So we're seeing a real increase in the threat out there. And you ask where they come from. Mm. In broad terms, uh, what I would say is we're seeing an increase in threats from criminals. We're seeing an increase in threats from you know what we call script kiddies and hacktivists, folk who sit in their, um, in their living rooms or garages and want to have a crack at firewalls and whatnot. But I think it's also fair to say that we're seeing an increase in threats from state-sponsored groups. And obviously, the Prime Minister had something to say about that a couple of weeks ago as he advised the, uh, the Australian public of the attack on Parliament House and the political parties. Are you worried of the level of the threats? Oh, well, I think it's a contest. And I, and I think we've got to keep these things in perspective. Yeah. Espionage is not new. Mm. I often talk about some of these techniques and some of these activities that have been around, you know, since, since biblical time. And when we talk about cyberspace, I mean, I, I have a view that there's actually not that much new cyberspace. Yeah, theft is still theft. Attack is still attack. Defence is still defence. Espionage is still espionage. What's new, of course, is the conduct of these activities in this relatively new um, sphere of, of cyberspace. And that's why the Australian Defence Force now recognises cyberspace as a warfighting domain. And Marcus, is your focus on defence and attack? Yes. It's a really interesting point because I reckon as I talk about cyber, a good 99 people out of 100 in their minds go straight to offence when in fact it's the defence of our networks and mission systems that is not only the most pressing priority it's also the much harder effect to achieve, also the, the more expensive effect yeah. to achieve. And, I, and I, 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 always, I talk about networks and mission systems because if you consider the military internet of yep. things, it, yep. this is not just about computer networks. As more and more military capability becomes digitised and, and more and more military equipment has a, an IP address, an internet protocol address, as everything becomes fly-by-wire, sail-by-wire and drive-by-wire, you know, some of these old-fashioned hydraulics uh, are being phased out of the Australian Defence Force inventory through investment in modern technology. You think, you know, that the first thing that's going to happen when that ship comes alongside, when that aircraft is towed into a hangar or when that vehicle pulls into a workshop is that someone is going to plug in an electronic device to that warfighting platform. The sort of things I worry about is, well, where's that device been? Who is the person plugging it in? Is it a contractor? Is it a, is it a public servant? Is it a, is it a member of the Defence Force? Is it someone we know? And what happened to that device before it was plugged in? You know, was it being used at the free Wi-Fi at McDonald's while that person was having breakfast that morning? You know, I wonder about those things and, and I worry about them. How much has it increased in the last five years? Difficult to quantify in numerical terms, but the last time the Australian Cyber Security Centre released a public threat report, which was in late 2017. Right. That report talked about there being some 47,000 attacks that were reported attacks. So those that were reported mm -hmm. against Australian government systems. And, purely, of that, and that's just purely government? That's right. Not business? I'd have to check now. It's a, it's a little while ago, but I, I remember the number 47,000 and that of that 47,000, there were, there were over 600 that required an operational response from the Australian Signals Directory. And that figure alone represented a significant increase in the previous report, and they haven't released another unclassified report since. Okay. But that trajectory, not quite exponential, but it was increasing significantly, and I can't imagine that that will have changed over the past 18 months or so. And what is an operational response, Marcus? Oh, well, that's an active defence response. Okay. And what are the major sort of trends or the, the tricks that you're, you're seeing out there? Again, difficult to quantify, and also perhaps might be irresponsible of me to get to be too specific yep. uh, about it. But what I will say is an increase in the quantity and an increase in the sophistication of the threat. And anything from socially engineered phishing attacks through to more sophisticated arrangements to, to penetrate networks and systems who compromise the confidentiality, integrity or availability of the information in those networks and mission systems. So when you practice your, your job day to day and you prepare against the, the baddies out there, what's the worst event you can think of? What would be the way they'd go about shutting the country down? Or can they do that? There's a particular scenario, and I, and I spoke publicly about this last month, mm -hmm. and my concern is that if the, if the threat comes at scale, yeah, mm -hmm. at scale. And what does that mean, at scale? If a large scale attack can currently hit critical infrastructure, yep. You know, there's a lot written or speculated about uh, power yeah. uh, and utilities and whatnot. Yeah. I mean, I think about critical infrastructure such as air traffic control, yeah. financial systems, yeah. uh, you know, how would we go if our credit cards didn't work? There's any number of, of combinations that I can think of not only have a significant effect on individuals but 
our community as a whole, our functioning of government. And they're the things that I think about in terms of, you know, gee, what would our national response be? And what would it be, Marcus? Oh, well, I think there's folk thinking about it and, you know, lots of questions being asked and we have some fabulous capabilities in the Australian Cyber Security Centre and, and the broader Australian Signals Directorate uh, and in law enforcement and the like. From my position, I'm always going to say, hey, look, if, you know, if I can attract more resources, I'll spend them. But where have you seen the scenario really work, Marcus, uh, outside of Australia? Where have you seen infrastructure shut down. There's been some really good examples mm -hmm. uh, that are in the open source, in the media and uh, over recent years. I mean, the big one was was the attack on Estonia a few years ago okay. and that crippled uh, critical infrastructure, financial systems and, and, and whatnot. And you see what Estonia has done since that in terms of modernising their systems, modernising their processes, you know, for, for a community that was and remains so dependent on networks and, and digital infrastructure, uh, that they've done a great job. And of course, it's Estonia that hosts in their capital talent, the NATO Cyber Centre of Excellence. Where do you think the Australian government is at or Australian business is at in understanding the real potential threat? I know for a fact that the government takes cyber security incredibly seriously and, and that's why capabilities such as the Australian Cyber Security Centre exist. It's why, from a defence perspective, the government is prepared to invest in the creation of an information warfare division yeah. and, uh, and cyber units within the Australian Defence Force. I do think there is more that business can do. And I think, to be fair, there are some areas of government and different layers of government that, that perhaps haven't invested yet. But I think it's, I think it's coming. Is there enough exchange between the military and corporate Australia? Well, in, in what regard? In the sense of swapping ideas or, or maybe not swapping, but mm. actually sharing of thoughts around the protection of classified information, the threat of cyber, as you say, and the ramifications of it? Well, I think, I mean, this is that's a little out of my remit. Yeah. My remit is the Australian Defence Force. And as you know, uh, law enforcement is not a defence mission. That said, there's a community of, of folk who understand this space. And, you know, we talk to each other and, and compare notes. I have fairly routine conversations with uh, with the banks, uh, with the telcos, certainly throughout the national security community of the of the federal government and others as comparing notes and approaches and sometimes tactics. Yeah, okay. Mm. And of the 47,000 attacks you talked about, without giving away the name of the countries, are we seeing a lot more state-based focus coming into Australia? Oh, well, as I said, I think there's been an uptick across the board in both state-sponsored, uh, criminal and what I might call, you know, hobbyists. And there's two really good reasons for that. Mm -hmm. you know, the first and, and perhaps the, the most obvious is that as Australians, we are every day, we become more and more dependent on information and our electronic devices yep. you know, for our day-to-day -day lives. Yep. My briefcase has three devices in it, you know, so, uh, and, and that's just me. I'm sure there's others who carry multiple um, devices, be they laptops, iPads, phones or whatnot. The second reason, of course, is that the barrier to entry for actors in mm -hmm. cyberspace are so low. It is cheap. It doesn't take many people necessarily. The, the attacker always has the initiative. It is the, uh, the barriers to entry are so low. And, and I think it's those two factors that, that are contributing to the increase that I'm seeing. And your focus in cyber, how long have you had your, your team? And what's the scale of the team? If yeah. You're, again, we're well, giving away too much. No, that's all right. I mean, our numbers are public knowledge. So, okay. so the creation of Information Warfare Division in July 2017 was an outcome of the Defence White Paper 2016 mm -hmm. that, uh, that highlighted uh, cyber, uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance uh, as, as priority capability development areas and allocated you know, additional people and additional resources uh, uh, to the development of those military capabilities. So we started with a, a relatively modest uh, number of folk in, in the organisation and, and we've, we've grown considerably in the 18 or 19 months or, or so since we stood up. And I've got remit across what we call the cyber warfare spectrum. We've had to think about how we chunk that up. Because as I said earlier, you know, I reckon 99% of people, when I say cyber, want to think about offence. And I kind of get that. But defence is the, is the priority and the harder effect uh, to, to achieve. I'll share with you, Greg, that I, you know, for years I fought um, cyber as a word. I always thought cyber was a prefix, you know, like aero or electro, you know, that was cyber something, cyber attack, cyber defence, cyber security, whatever it was. Yeah. Um, I'll share with you that I've since learned that there's resources associated with cyber, th that great word. So I'm all in. It's a fantastic word and I use it all the time. Um, although I've still struggled to use it. I still hear people use it as a verb, you know, like, can you, can you cyber them? Yeah. Uh, 
No. So we needed to bring some structure to, yeah. to that conversation. So we look at it through four lenses. And broadly speaking, the four lenses are self-defense, passive defense, active defense, and, and offense. Mm-hmm. And now offense is offense. If you're not in government, then you're not doing that because it'd be illegal. All right? so, so let me just focus on the, on the defensive aspects, which is the priority and the harder effect to achieve. So the the self-defense piece, th- this is about culture, it's about awareness, it's about knowledge, it's about, about the entire workforce, it's everyone's responsibility. It's that don't be that person who clicks on the link in the phishing email, you know. Don't be that person who finds a USB stick in the car park and plugs it into the system t- to see what's on it. Don't be that person who is giving away highly valuable uh, organizational information through social media. Yeah, right. Yeah, and it's and it's not just that single post into social media. It's that long term aggregation. It's what can someone who bodes you ill? Yep. What can that person um, pull together out of all of the threads of social media and elsewhere yep. and paint a picture of you and design an attack against you, whether it's for criminal purposes or for something else? You know, what are you posting online? How do you keep yourself, your mates, and your family safe in cyberspace? Right. So that's self defence, and, and 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 I can you know if you bring me back. To so that there's a I've got a couple of examples that I can that I can share. The passive defence. This is the domain of the communicators and the and the system administrators. You say right. Well, if you're if you're responsible for a network or a mission system, you think about its defence. You know, are you compliant with the ASD Essential Eight? It's on their website. They've got eight criteria listed. ASD has eight criteria listed on their website that, if applied, uh, are reported to stop around eighty five percent of known of known threats. So, how many people have administrator rights? On your, on your system? Are you whitelisting uh, applications? Are you patching and updating your system? And I think the key there is, do you have sufficient situational understanding of your network or system so that you can see anomalies when they come up and therefore do something about it? So that's the passive defence piece. And, and I think most folk understand that. The next is this active defence. And this is this is a bit harder for folk to achieve and get their, get their heads around. So I draw an analogy here to defending a forward operating base, say, in Afghanistan or whatnot. And sure, mm. we, you know, from a self-defence perspective, you know, if there's a threat of indirect fire of rockets or artillery coming into the forward operating base, we wear body armour and helmets. We, we spread out to minimise any impact of a detonation. We have places that we can run and dive for shelter, right? That, that's the, the, the self-defence. You know, the, the passive defence, yeah, we do. We, we put up the concrete walls. We, we put up the HESCO barriers. Um, you know, we might have an early warning system, a siren that goes off. But we don't stop there. You know, we don't sit inside the forward operating base waiting for the rockets to come. You know, we, we patrol the area around the base. We analyse known launch sites and we patrol those launch sites. We call them rocket boxes. Yep. We patrol those launch sites with a rules of engagement that allows us to defend ourselves and those it is our duty to protect. Mm-hmm. It's the same for cyberspace. It's that having people sitting on our networks, our systems, actively seeking out and countering threat activity. That's the piece that is necessarily smaller numbers of more highly trained people. I think I can safely share with you that that's been the priority development area that I've been focusing on uh, for the last 12 months. And can you take us back to the examples you're going to talk through regarding yeah. social activity? So so if I come back to that self-defence mm. piece and uh, we could headline this with the, you know, the ills of social media. Now, mm. now, let me say up front that I'm not a complete Luddite here. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I recognise that there are positive uses for social media, but let me share with you a, a, a negative. In an organisation such as the Australian Army, and that is pretty comfortable with keeping its secrets and, and whatnot, you'd think we'd, we'd have this pretty much down pat. But let me share with you an example from a, a major field exercise in, in 2016. I was a brigade commander at, at the time that, that had our cyber capability uh, in it. And we ran a, an activity that, that was contributing to the, the red force, the threat force, the opposing force in the exercise. It was called Exercise Hamel. It's, uh, it's um, Army's major annual field exercise. And the exercise was in was conducted in South Australia at a training area called Kaltana uh, in between sort of Port Augusta and, and Wyala there in, in South Australia. There's about 4,000 people in the blue force, the, the, the friendly force, the force actually being exercised, right? Um, so that's in South Australia. I set up a little team in Toowoomba 
a couple of thousand kilometres away, 12 people. It was five cyber operators, five intelligence operators and two lawyers. So two lawyers, very important because that was to ensure that, that the team absolutely 100% complied with our obligations under the Privacy Act. Okay. A very, very important function. This activity was monitoring the social media activity of the Australian Defence Force members in the exercise area, right? It was social media monitoring and that team had it, its rules of engagement was to, of course, not move past any passwords. That's that was not the aim here, and that their their monitoring was to cease as soon as their line of inquiry extended beyond the member of the Australian Defence Force to any family or friends or, or whatnot. You know, that's important. That's the obligations under privacy. That team, 12 people, it took them less than 48 hours to completely unpack the Blue Force. They had unit nomenclature, unit names. They had unit locations in the war game, you know, through geotagged images being posted to social media. And in some cases, they had unit intent. I said there's about 4,000 people in the Blue Force. Um, so, yeah, and th there were uh, over 600 in that 48 hours, over 600 files on individuals that led directly to actionable, targetable intelligence. It was not a good hit out. It was a nice little wake-up call for Army's combat force. How did you start it? How did, where, where was the first bit of information which was the beginning of cracking the code? It starts with just looking at social media activity in the exercise area. What, so someone put on their phone, I'm, I'm about to go into battle, or what, what actually happened? Well, it's, yeah, uh, or in took some, a photo in, of a couple of mates standing there and there's a, uh, there's a map behind them. What actually happened? It, there was one in particular that was a, uh, unit, a unit had its birthday. In, um, in, in during the exercise, a uh, lovely photo of, of folk with a birthday cake, you know, in, in front of equipment. And of course, the phone that photo was geotagged, so it had the GPS coordinates embedded in in the photo. And so simple, isn't it? And it's quite simple to to neck down your review of social media activity to a geographic area. And so that's what that's what they did, and, and that was 2016. So effectively, you could have wiped that. That was it. Blue were gone under your command. Effectively, you could have put the strike weapons in. You got all the information. You destroyed them. Oh well, well out hours if you wanted well, to. Perhaps not as black and white as that, but but certainly um, the threat force commander was very happy with the information that that team was presenting, or the intelligence that that that, that team was was presenting to him. That was the first hit out, right? So that was the first time Army had done it. I spoke publicly about it at the time, and, and in fact, a, a colleague and I wrote a wrote a paper on it that was published. That was 2016, right? That, that was a baseline, and it's a pretty low baseline. And I'll share with you: 12 months later, similar exercise, similar activity conducted, and there was a noticeable improvement. Overall, um, that said, and, and this is the thing: you're only as, as strong as your weakest link. Yeah. Right? But that said, during that exercise that in, in 2017, um, an individual posted to social media a geotagged image from the inside of a command post, and the image included the battle map. You know, so here I am, and here's where everyone else is. Yeah, so it only takes one. Again, that's 2017. I can assure you, and I can assure your listeners, Greg, that is uh, much, much better today. And indeed, the Australian Defence Force is is much, much better today. But it just highlights yeah, well. how easy it is, and and this will be the same in industry as it is in the public sector. Is just how easy it is for vulnerabilities to emerge from perhaps the best of intentions, but information being placed voluntarily into the public domain yeah, right. that nefarious actors can can collate and uh, pull together in a way that enables them to generate an attack. And Marcus, just on that, getting that a bit of information, as you said, the battle map behind that soldier or whoever it was, was that actually complex work to get that information or was that actually in the world of cyber reasonably easy That's based on the sophistication you're talking about? from those foreign nations out there potentially looking at us. That image was posted to a public Twitter account, so visible to anyone with an internet connection. Right? And this is the thing. For any of your listeners interested in, in improving their cyber security, I would recommend starting with a look at your organisational social media policy. Mark, is following up on that, is there, is there enough level of questioning inside, you think, corporates or the Australian public I think there's, there's there's always more to be done here, and uh, and especially given that this environment is just so dynamic, it is different every single day. I was reading a little while ago a claim that there's a new piece of malware on the street uh, every 13 seconds, you know, forecast to drop to every seven seconds over the next couple of years. You know, okay. this this environment, cyberspace, is not a fire and forget environment. It's it's dynamic. It's constantly changing. There's new threat actors every day, and folk who are interested in countering those threats you know, need to have a similarly dynamic 
way of of, of thinking. And and I look at, and I mentioned the thinking through the self defence piece. You know, mm. what are you freely giving away yep. to the, to anyone with an internet connection? I think the passive defence piece. I'd be encouraging anyone with internet facing networks with internet facing systems that include information that is valuable to the organisation to be aggressively pursuing the ASD Essential 8. Yeah, have a look at their website and, and, and look at what those eight measures are that will stop 85% of known threats. And then from there, my firm belief is that it's then it's then up to leaders to just keep asking questions. So for 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 directors, for C suite, for uh, for senior leaders to just keep asking questions of the CIO, of the CISO, of the chief risk officer until you're satisfied with the answer. And the first question might be, how compliant are we with the ASD Essential Eight? And I think just keep asking questions so that leaders can be satisfied that the CIO, that the CISO, that the chief risk officer is not marking their own homework. Marcus, in regards to the military, how are operations being played out there in Cyberland? It's a good question, Greg. And I've got to level with you. It's a really difficult question for me to, to answer. But what I would offer is that uh, for anyone who's interested in, in how military cyber operations might play out, have a read of a book that was published in 2015 um, by uh, authors by the name of P.W. Singer and August Cole. And the book is called Ghost Fleet. It's a, uh, it's a futuristic action novel in the Tom Clancy genre. It has several vignettes that, that, that I'll tell you when I was reading it um, at the end of 2015, I felt a little bit uncomfortable. Some of those vignettes were, uh, were a little bit close to, to the bone. Others are pure science fiction, but, but that's because the authors are, are, are future looking. And anyone who's interested in how a cyber war, inverted commas, uh, might play out, go and have a read of Ghost Fleet. Marcus, from the days you walked in as a young officer at Duntroon, to now, where's the emphasis going to be in the next five to ten years? What are the skills that you've seen, and where's the, how's the game changed, and how's that affected the Australian Defence Force? Oh, it's a it's a cracking question. So that day when I walked in or marched into uh, in, into Duntroon, it's coming up to thirty two years ago, Greg, and I can tell you it's a very 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 different army back then. You know, our instructors had served in in the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. and uh, even then they were close to to retirement. Our Defence Force was in was during a a sustained period of not not quite peace, but, but uh, we hadn't had combat operations you know, for, for some time. Sure, there'd been the, the United Nations deployments and whatnot, all very important in terms of representing Australia's uh, national interests. Um, it was very, very different army back then. It was very low-tech, um, very mandrolic in what we did, very male back then. I'd offer that, that our army of today is very high-tech. The men and women uh, who serve in our army are smart, professional, uh, determined, tough, you know, um, not that folk weren't determined and tough 32 years ago, but I, I just, every time I have an interaction with uh, with our soldiers these days, because I don't, I don't get to see our soldiers that often these days, but every time I do, I just come away inspired. They are just wonderful. A fair question regarding the, the, the skill sets. We have infantry soldiers can carry between five and seven devices on their body that have IP addresses. There's none of this cannon fodder infantry business anymore. These young men and women are uh, technically savvy and know how to use their kit to generate an effect. It is inspiring. That emphasis on technology, um, that requirement to be tech savvy yeah. uh, is, is only going to increase um, for, for Army and for the Defence Force. The big saving grace for us, of course, is that, you know, and my next birthday's a, a, a big round number. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely a digital immigrant, but the 18, 19, 20-year-old who are joining the Defence Force these days have, have grown up in the internet age uh, and they are naturally comfortable with that form of technology. As the demand for uh, digitisation uh, continues, um, the requirement to uh, protect those digital systems just becomes a higher and higher priority. I have every confidence that our people will rise to the challenge. Do you lead differently these days, Marcus? Yeah, we have to, especially with this cyber workforce. Mm. They have a unique culture. It's a culture that has less emphasis on rank and more emphasis on skills and ability. Yeah. It does require a, a different form of, uh, of leadership, certainly more, more consultative. Leaders in this field need to spend more time explaining the why uh, behind particular instructions. The young men and women in this capability, they are some of the smartest people on the face of the planet and they're not the sort of people who accept the you know, just shut up and do it, that might have once, well, they'll still fix bayonets, they just need to understand why they are 
fixing bayonets uh, and, and why they are being asked to do um, what they're being asked to do. Yeah. They're absolutely professional. That's not to imply, um, you know, disobedience or insubordination or, or far from it. It's just we spend the extra time explaining the why behind the instructions to these young men and women. They'll adopt that as their own um, and, uh, and and just run with it. It's uh, it's inspiring to see. Is the is the flip side of this? Is it hard to keep them, Marcus? Are they getting poached by Australian corporates? No more than any of our other technical trades. Probably unfair to say poached. Um, I'm fairly sanguine about that. I mean, I, Australian Defence Force has a core skill in taking someone off the street and training them in valuable skills, training them into something. Um, that, that, that makes them incredibly valuable for the entire community. And not every person who rocks up to a Defence Force recruiting office is going to serve 30-odd years. You know, that's, that's, that's just not the way it is. I think we have some wonderful personnel policies in place to attract young men and women. Mm. I think we have some wonderful personnel policies in place to retain them. And I think we've got some awesome policy in place to allow folk to transit in and out of full-time employment with the Defence Force. And that's going to be really important for our cyber workforce because not n- not everyone's going to serve 30 years. So uh, how does that work, Marcus? It is quite simple now to transition between uh, full-time and reserve service, part-time service. And I've got plenty of folk who transition out because they've got an opportunity that they want to explore or their family circumstances are such that they need to transition out of the full-time employment in the Defence Force. Many of them come back, come back into full-time service. Um, Sometimes it's months, sometimes it's years, uh, but uh, uh, provided they've continued to work on their skills, look, if they're they're working in in a relevant area, and that their values continue to, to align with ours, you know, it is, it is welcome. You know, going to the part-time, they, they never left. It's, yeah. just, it's just a transition between full-time and part-time service. Before you go, Marcus, for all Australians out there, how do we actually protect ourselves from these potential cyber attacks you've been talking about? There is uh, so much to that. Let me offer my personal view. I think the first step is to recognise that there is a threat out there, the threat is real, and that there are people in the world who, who will seek to use your personal information against you. And accept that and, and take measures to protect yourself and your, and your mates and your family. Think about your privacy settings on social media. Don't reuse passwords. Be careful what you freely give away to the internet through social media and other platforms. Don't click on the link in the email. If you don't know where the USB stick has come from, don't plug it into your system. And I would offer also to report suspicious activity. Report suspicious activity, either to your to your internet service provider or to your system administrator. Um, depending on your circumstances, report suspicious activity because just like the threat will look to aggregate information and build a picture, the folk who are countering this will also look to build a picture and they can only do so if you report uh, suspicious activity. Wise advice. Marcus, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a great show. My pleasure, Greg. You've been listening to No Limitations. 